good together. <laughs> It's a good actor. I hope it's a good one. No, it's a good one. Okay, thank you. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, program will begin in a couple minutes. If you take this opportunity to silence your cell phones, that would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning and welcome to the Department of Energy's 2019 Women's History Month celebration. Thank you for those of you attending here in the auditorium of the Forestall Building and those of you who are viewing us uh, via live stream across the country. My name is Mary Ann Fresco and I'm the Director of Employee Empowerment Within the, within the National Nuclear Security Administration. And I have the privilege of fostering and leading a diverse, inclusive, engaged, and empowered workforce every day. Today's program is a collaborative effort between the uh, Office of Economic Impact and Diversity, the National Nuclear Security Administration, and POWER, which is also known as Professional Opportunities for women at Energy Realized. At this time, I would like to introduce the Director of the Office of Economic Impact and Diversity, the Honorable James Campos. Mr. Campos was nominated by the President of the United States and confirmed by the United States Senate on April 9, 2018. As director, Mr. Campos oversees the Office of Minority Economic Impact and the Office of Civil Rights and Diversity. He is tasked with helping to implement legislation and executive orders with an eye towards their effect on minorities in regards to education and business, as well as ensuring minorities are afforded an opportunity to fully participate in department programs. 
Additionally, he serves as the department's Equal Employment Opportunity Director, complex-wide. Mr. Campos functions as the department's designee on various White House initiatives, such as the Educational Excellence for Hispanics, the Initiative on Asian American Pacific Islanders, the Initiative to Promote Excellence and Innovation at Historically Black Colleges and Universities, and the White House Opportunity for Revitalization Council. Please join me in welcoming the Director of the Office of Impact and Diversity, the Honorable James Campos. Thank you, Marianne, for the kind introduction. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Department. Department's Women's History Month celebration is indeed a special occasion for us all. Today we celebrate women throughout U.S. history who dedicated their lives to achieving equal rights for all Americans and how, and how they helped mold a society where women can pursue the highest levels of education, businesses, service to our military, service uh, in the highest offices of, of our nation, and achieving everything they set their minds to do. A minister, Lisa Gordon Haggerty, is a prime example of society they envisioned. Last year, she became the first woman in history to lead the National Nuclear Security Administration. She holds a Master of Public Health and a Bachelor of Science degree from the University of Michigan and came to the DOE with over 30 years of national security experience, holding many significant leadership positions. Today's panelists have remarkable achievements as well. DeMichael Bryan is Deputy U.S. Marshal for the, well, oh, sorry, Tomoko Bryan is a Deputy U.S. Marshal who was the only woman in her training academy class. Dr. Rutley works for NASA, where she plays an active role in the science activities helping, happening on the International Space Station. Michelle Smith of, the, of NNSA is responsible for several key nonproliferation and arms control initiatives. Nicole Spencer is a veteran of the U.S. Air Force and is now Supervisory Special Agent in the Weapons of Mass Destruction Directorate at the FBI. These are amazing accomplishments, and each one of you serve as an inspiration to every person on how one's determination and courage can break down any barrier. Our nation's future is brighter because of women just like you. With that, everyone please rise for the presentation of the colors by the Joint Armed Forces Honor Guard, followed by this uh, singing of the national anthem by Daniel Hill. And the rocket 
Gentlemen, please welcome Secretary of Energy Rick Perry. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Secretary of Energy Rick Perry. Y'all sit down. Please have a seat. I know we're here for uh, National Women's History Month, but Daniel Hill, you are awesome. Uh, that come on, me. I don't know where he is. If he's left the left the building, but, uh, that was just with all. Uh, all respect to the USA Today reporter that said she's kind of done with uh, singing the national anthem. I kind of like doing that uh, and, and having a great talent like Daniel do that. So anyway, thank you for um, not only honoring our, uh, our country and our flag, and, uh, uh, but for honoring uh, the men and women that are in this room today uh, with that great presentation. So. Um, this month gives us uh, the opportunity to acknowledge and reflect on and, and uh, be inspired by the role women have played uh, in our nation's history. And uh, that is a incredibly long and broad and deep and intense, uh, uh, appropriate uh, salute to uh, the women who have affected all of our lives in a lot of different ways. Uh, I, get, uh, I get to be influenced by some pretty powerful women uh, in, a, in a regular basis. Um, some that don't have a lot of years of age on them, six and four year old granddaughters. Um, and um, an amazing wife and a professional in her own right, uh, former first lady of Texas. And so today will be a very inadequate uh, attempt to give all of those women personally in my life a, a shout out, but uh, you know, all too often, um, or I'm, I'm glad we're doing this because it, it gives us the opportunity to, uh, from time to time, um, women's achievements get overshadowed, they get overlooked. Um, but they have been instrumental in the fabric of this country, um, to the, the country's prosperity, to the country's security. Um, and as Secretary of Energy, I get to see it every day. Um, I'm proud to lead a department that uh, has such a strong history of uh, women innovators, 
women leaders. Um, one of my aha moments as the Secretary of Energy was when I got given the little book, The uh, Girls of Atomic City, and I got to meet one of them while we were out at Oak Ridge, and, and uh, they, they worked on the Manhattan Project, and um, yeah, whether it was uh, Hazel O'Leary that came in, the first Secretary of Energy, and, and uh, her uh, impact uh, on this place, and the men and women who work here, um, you know, generations of, of women scientists. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm, I've, I've got a audible um, story. Madame Curie this is one of their uh, audible originals that uh, um, talking about women scientists and how they affected uh, the world and the great contributions that, uh, that they have made. Uh, when you look at our national labs and, and the, uh, uh, the outstanding individuals who have changed our nation for the better. Uh, had a real impact on the world that we live in. So, um, and I could not be prouder of the women at the Department of Energy. Um, seeing them, their successors, is why STEM education is, is so important. It, it, it reminded, when I, every time I see STEM now, Lisa, I think about um, my engagement with uh, FIRST Robotics. Uh, this, this is a global competition. I, we, I, I, I don't know whether you've actually been to these competitions or not, but they're, they're, they're fascinating. I, I got introduced to them as a, a relatively uh, new governor back in the early 2000s. They were having one of the regional competitions in Houston. Uh, and, and then subsequently, I, through this uh, job, I got recycled back into the relationship with them and seeing them. They had their competition again in Houston in, uh, in, in 2017. Uh, last year it was in Mexico City. 190 countries are competing, uh, these robotics teams from all over the world. I mean, tens of thousands of teams starting out and then consolidated down to this world championship. This next year will be in the UAE. 60% of those teams are captained by females. The, the road into science and technology and engineering and math is being leveled, paved by young women who are going to be sitting in your seats 5, 10, 15 years from now. That's, that's exciting for me to get to see how your pioneering work uh, is, is impacting young people today. Um, you know, the BWIS program, uh, Brookhaven Laboratories Women in Science. It's dedicated to promoting um, equal opportunity for all women, improving the quality of life for the employees at that lab. Um, and these are critical programs. They're critical programs to ensure that we have a strong workforce going into the future. Um, that we got the best talent, that we've got the ingenuity to continue to uh, lead this country. And, and, and when you're leading America, you're leading the world. Um, now look, we've still got some work to do, uh, but it gives me great hope when I look at these, uh, these young women that are leading these teams. When I look at that Afghan team and it's women, there's a powerful message there about we're we're on the right side of this deal. <laughs> um, you know, uh, we've had, uh, is Linda Capuano in here? Is, I don't know, she's down there estimating what we're doing on energy right now uh, and what we're happening. But she's a great example of, of uh, uh, you know, she's the first woman to, to serve as the administrator of the uh, Energy Information 
uh, administration. Uh, and uh, I don't know, is Anne Marie White in here? Um, she was just in a briefing with me, uh, Assistant Secretary for Environmental Management, Karen Evans, who's uh, uh, running our Office of Cybersecurity, Energy Security, and, and uh, Emergency Response, uh, the program that you hear us talk about, CSER. Um, Lisa Garden Haggerty, uh, the first uh, female to head up um, two thirds of the budget of the Department of Energy. Uh, and uh, um, she's, you know, you, this is a class act in every way that you can think about it. Uh, a person who uh, can sit down across the table with the President of the United States, and when the meeting's over with, he came up and says, um, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, completely blown away with uh, uh, the capability, the power, the, uh, the integrity of, of that individual that's working with you. Uh, th that is the type of, 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 of compliment that um, I, I'm, I'm proud to be able to receive as the, uh, as, as the secretary and, 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 and just to share with people in the administration on the Hill that this is the quality of men and women uh, that are at the Department of Energy. It's the reason when I get up and talk about this is the coolest job in the world. And the reason it's the coolest job in the world is because of the people I get to work with. It's because of the, of, of sure, it's the technology and the, and the fascinating things. But at the heart of this, it's the men and women. And to have uh, women in these positions. One of the things I was incredibly proud of as is, is, is a governor, to be able to, to, to give people the opportunity to excel maybe individuals who had been overlooked before, for whatever reason that our society overlooked them, to give them that opportunity. The first Latina that ever served on the Texas Supreme Court. The first Indian American female to ever be the Secretary of State. To be able to put people in that place and to see them excel, just like those women that I've mentioned to you here today. They didn't get there because of their gender. They got there because they're the best at what they do. But the message to those young women sitting in a class somewhere, when they see the Lisa Gordon Haggerty's, when they see the Karen Evans, when they see the Anne Marie Whites, and they go, I want to do what you do. And you've knocked down the door. You've paved the way. That's the power of what you find yourself in this role model. And uh, many of you may not have put your hand up and said, I want to be a role model, but you are. And thank you for taking the challenge. Thank you for stepping outside of your comfort zone and, and doing what you do uh, on a daily basis. So. Uh, as we commemorate National um, Women's History Month here at the department and, and across government, um, know that the Department of Energy is at the forefront. We are literally at the tip of the spear of women making a massive difference in young people's lives and in the lives of people around the world because of the agency that you get to work with. So with that, let me bring up one of those that I've uh, talked about a little bit today and you get to see firsthand, if not some of you second, third, and fourth hand uh, multiple times a day, Lisa Garden Haggerty, the head of our. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Knock him dead. Well, thank you, Mr. Secretary, for that kind introduction and your continued support and confidence in me to lead the fine men and women throughout our nuclear security enterprise. I am truly blessed every single day by this honor and privilege. I would also like to thank Mr. Campos for the opportunity to, to, to deliver the keynote address this morning and to share with you some personal thoughts with our colleagues throughout DOE and highlighting the contributions of some of the finest women representing our great nation. I look forward also to hearing from the panel of many competent and qualified female leadership from our U.S. government. Thanks for joining us this morning. Good morning, everyone. When I was offered this very special opportunity to speak at this event, I accepted without hesitation. 
Okay, that was easy. Now the difficult part. What can I say that might resonate with some of the smartest, most capable colleagues with whom I've ever had an opportunity to work? So let me start with the basics. Nuclear terrorism, military application, shale gas, commercial nuclear power generation, high-performance computing, nuclear propulsion, Caesar. You know, topics that most of the public think about at least a couple times a day. Well, they may not, but we certainly do. And that's because we are presented every day with the opportunity to work beside the best and the brightest on some of the most cutting edge and exciting portfolios ever imagined. As we celebrate visionary women during the month of March, we need not be reminded that women have been innovating in the fields of science and technology, in philosophy and education, since the beginning of time. Even though we may not have necessarily been recognized for so many crucial contributions as we are today. According to Pew Research, however, Women now make up more, a more significant portion of U.S. leadership in national security positions than ever before, from the private sector to right here at DOE and NNSA. And I would also like to tick off a couple of names that might be familiar with you, although the secretary did seem to steal my thunder. The Honorable Ann White, <laughs> the Honorable Karen Evans, NNSA Associate Administrator Nora Khalil, Savannah River Field Office Manager, Nicole Nelson-Jean, Teresa Robbins from the NNSA production site. Just a few shining examples of skilled, strong, visionary leaders who just happen to be women and with whom I am proud to serve. I am pleased to report that overall, women make up more than 36% of the workforce here at DOE, and at NNSA, it's nearly 42. And these women individuals are positioned throughout our enterprise as scientists, engineers, technicians, researchers, project managers, budget analysts, and foreign affairs specialists, and as a certain undersecretary and administrator of the NNSA. The list goes on. And that's today's workforce. As the secretary noted, NNSA is actively recruiting the future workforce and leaders for our nuclear security enterprise dedicated, driven professionals with a desire to serve our country. And the ideal candidate could just as easily be a woman as a man. The world, and in our case, DOE, is our oyster. But it goes far beyond gender. We celebrate diversity throughout our workforce. One's race, one's denomination, age, all bring different perspectives, different experiences, and different ideas to solve any challenge posed to us. And that is a good thing. All those diverse traits lead back to the person, their capabilities, competencies, their desire to be among the best our nation has to offer in support of our national, economic, energy, and global security. Now on to a few examples and acknowledgments of the female trailblazers who came before us and are paving the way to make our workplace more inviting. Long before there was a DOE, there were women strengthening our, our nation through nuclear security. The first head of the Atomic Energy Commission chairman was a chairwoman, Dixie Lee Ray. If you ever have had a chance to speak with her, or he, excuse me, hear about her, uh, you really need to take a look at her. She's really been one of the icons, I think, throughout the Atomic Energy Commission. She went on to be the governor of the state of Washington. Has anyone ever heard of Betty Carroll? She was the first female mechanical engineer at Sandia National Laboratories in California. She was hired in 1959 and worked alongside 350 male peers to keep our nation safe. Nuclear physicist Jane Hamilton Hall worked at Los Alamos National Laboratory beside her husband. And I'm happy to say that in her 1946 performance review, stated she was not of secondary importance <laughs> on that project. Wow. <laughs> In fact, she went on to become an assistant director at Los Alamos, so good for her. And I'll also mention a common favorite, and the secretary had alluded to them as well, the Calutron girls. 
These young women applied for positions not knowing what they were working on because it was so highly classified. But it was just important and vital to the war effort at Y-12 in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. And they did their jobs well. Although sometimes it often engenders a giggle, the women were widely acknowledged to be more effective than the male scientists in keeping the equipment operating. The men were constantly fiddling with the equipment dials, thereby negatively affecting operations, and the ladies returned the system to steady state conditions. And on a personal note related to the Calutron girls, I had the distinct pleasure of meeting one of these women this spring at Y-12. Ruth Huddleston was just 18 when she took a job at the Secret City in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. She's now 90 plus years old and shared several stories, one of which stands out in my mind. Mrs. Huddleston's family never knew what she did until one day her, grand, her granddaughter was working on a school project. She said, oh, that's where I worked during World War II. To which her family replied, we never knew that. Why didn't you ever tell us? Mrs. Huddleston plainly stated, because they told us not to. <laughs> now that's good operational security. <laughs> <laughs> These women are inspirations that we can look back on any time we need a little encouragement and from whom we can inspire others. I encourage you to think about and reflect upon your own stories from past experiences and begin developing some of your own stories that you might share with other women to give them ins additional inspiration. I was also asked to mention some personal thoughts about women who have given me hope and guidance, and that's a very easy one for me. My personal inspiration is my mom. My dad was a Detroit police officer by day and a professional musician by night. After they were married, although my mom worked, she decided to stay home and raise six kids before work, returning to the workforce. She became a top-selling realtor for more than 20 years and then pursued the dream and became a jeweler. She is the epitome of bringing home the bacon and frying it up in the pan. And with eight mouths to feed, there's a lot of bacon to, that needs to be fried. There's also, there's nothing my mom can't do. I've looked to her my whole life as my role model. She's 93 and going strong, and she's on her third computer as well. Just yesterday, she re returned home to her home state of Ohio after spending a week with two of my three sisters on the warm and sunny beaches of Mexico. I've also been fortunate enough to have had female and male mentors throughout my career. And I've had the opportunity to be a mentor an employee once asked me if I would mentor his daughter, who was a high school student at the time. She worked in our office every summer throughout college and ultimately became a senior leader at the CIA. It's a humbling experience to think I may have played a small role or part in that person's life. I encourage you all to be mentors. Seek out someone, a neighbor, a niece, and find out what their plans are, what they might be worrying about, and how you might be able to encourage them and help them work through it. Aim them to inspire high and apply for a job at the NNSA. Do the same with your colleagues, both female and male. Take time to listen and to talk and seek their advice in kind. Everyone has a story and experience to share. You may have seen that Next month, on April 25th, it's Take Your Daughters and Sons to Work Day. I encourage all parents, and especially the moms out there, to consider bringing your children with you that day. It's so important for young people to see how many ways their parents, their relatives, or their neighbors are contributing to the betterment of our nation. Every woman and man of the DOE and NNSA are shining examples of our mission, and they should be part of that perhaps in the future as well. I hope I've established a pattern here. Even though some might focus exclusively on gender, I truly believe it's about qualifications, merits, and capabilities. It's about who is the most effective in any particular role. It's that person who is disciplined and driven enough to get the job done. And I am not at all surprised when those best qualified are women. I would be remiss if I did not touch on how DOE and its predecessor agencies from the Atomic Energy Commission onward have been at the heart 
of the 20th and 21st century peace, which is a theme of this event. Through our missions, women are notably maintaining energy security and national security through arms control, treaties, and by facilitating and assisting other nations to be as wealthy and prosperous through energy generation. Sadly, though, it's no surprise that the world is becoming less safe. As former Secretary of Defense Mattis observed, a safe, secure, and effective nuclear deterrent is there to ensure a war that can never be won is never fought. And we are at the center of that peace. Peace which has been kept for the past seven decades and with our continued vigilance and support for all of the future. We live in the greatest nation our world has ever known and in a time and place where if you can dream it, you can live it. So many women before us have laid the foundation for the opportunities ahead. It is now our turn to continue to build upon that foundation and not waste their blood, sweat, and tears. Let's build that second story. I want to leave you with an idea for your consideration. Let's not celebrate Women's Month in March. We should be celebrating contributions women have made to our world every single day. After all, none of us would be here without them. Thank you. How about another round of applause for our Undersecretary for Nuclear Security, Gordon Haggerty. Thank you, Undersecretary Haggerty, Gordon Haggerty, for your enlightening and educational remarks on the rich history of visionary women and who were champions of peace and nonviolence. Um, women have expanded the American tradition of using inclusive and active means to reduce violence achieve peace, and to promote the common good for all. At this time, I would like to welcome to the stage Ms. Cecily Johnson from the Office of DOE's Equity and Diversity and our distinguished panelists. Um, Michelle Smith, Deputy Director, Office of Nuclear Verification within the National Nuclear Security Administration. McCole Spencer, Supervisory Special Agent, with the Federal Bureau of Investigation, U.S. Department of Justice. Uh, Dr. Tara Rutley, Associate Chief Scientist for Microgravity Research, National Aeronautics and Space <coughs> Administration. And Tamiko Bryant, the Deputy United States Marshal, United, uh, United States Marshal Service, United States Department of Justice. Well, good morning. Uh, thank you all for being here. My name is Cecily Johnson, and I am the Affirmative Employment Program Manager for the department and also the Federally Employed Women's Program Manager for the department. So I want to thank you all for being here, and especially to the Undersecretary. I really appreciated your, your keynote speech. Thank you very much. Um, so what I'm going to do, because you can all, you all pretty much probably know me from the uh, bio, I'm going to go around and... Um, have them share a little bit about themselves, and I will give you a little bit of what we've done. We all, what, we had a moment together mm -hmm. where we had lunch, so we were able to talk about things, and I learned so much from each one of them, so hopefully this will be an impactful session to learn more about what they do. So let's start with McCole. Tell me a little bit about what you do at the FBI. All right, thank you for having me on the panel. I really appreciate it. Um, I, I, well, I started my career off in the military. I started off in the United States Air Force. Um, I joined when I was 17 years old because I always knew from the ripe age of nine that I wanted to be an FBI agent. So after I achieved um, several degrees, I decided I was good enough to join, and so I joined uh, at the ripe age of 27. And so far, I've been at headquarters for about six years, working in the weapons of mass destruction. I'm Michelle Smith. Um, I'm here in uh, the Department of Energy in the National Nuclear Security Administration. Been here for quite a while. Uh, I started up um, at DOE 
um, in the defense program's intern program where they took scientists and engineers right out of the university and taught us how to be uh, technical managers. And uh, that was back when uh, I first met our administrator uh, through that program. Anyway, um, growing up in the Midwest, I got my nuclear engineering degree from the University of Missouri Rolla, uh, came to DOE, uh, started doing materials control and accountability, uh, making uh, for nuclear materials here in uh, DOE sites. When the Soviet <coughs> Union broke apart, we started working with them about how to do materials control and accountability, and that's how I ended up being in the Office of uh, Nuclear Verification. And we tend to look at uh, <coughs> nuclear weapons and how do you verify the dismantlement for that. And so I kind of switched hats from being a nuclear engineer to technically being a foreign affairs specialist. But the uh, work that I do is very technical and so I still use that nuclear engineering background. Yep. <coughs> Hi, I'm Tara, I'm from NASA, and I'm geeking out to be here at the DOE because it's my first visit. You guys are awesome. Uh, and I especially love being among my federal agency cousins. So it's always a pleasure to find out what you guys are all doing um, uh, along, alongside NASA. Um, I too knew from like the age of nine that I wanted to work for the space program. Uh, particularly, I wanted to be an astronaut. And so, uh, I was going to pursue that path as a pilot because I loved fighter jets. I wanted to be in the Air Force. And the older I got in high school, I realized what the jets were really used for and decided I was not, I was probably not tough enough to do that, that kind of a job. But um, so I went the academic route, went to college, earned my bachelor's in biology, my master's in mechanical engineering, and got hired uh, by NASA uh, as an engineer right away which was a shock, because it was nothing that I had wanted to do. I actually did not want to be an engineer, but it turns out uh, this was a biomedical engineering position, creating um, hardware, um, uh, medical hardware and exercise hardware for the space station. So as a very young engineer, I concurrently pursued my PhD in neuroscience at the same time, which is my true love. And after eight years in engineering, I had my daughter, uh, came back, things were a little different. Uh, one of my male colleagues actually said, you know, you should just take this time in your career to just time out, be a mom. And you know, of, uh, you, know you could look at that and say, what did you just say to me? Uh, but I actually, I actually considered his advice and I actually slowed down a bit, slowed down in my career, slowed down in my mindset and, and focused on being a mom uh, for about a year or two while I was still maintaining my position at NASA and then applied for a position in the space station science office because now I have my science degree and that was my true love. And uh, all along the way I had mentors I didn't know that were mentoring me, they were wonderful. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, that's how I ended up. Now I'm at headquarters, been here for the last year, um, working on the International Space Station, which is the symbolic, you know, it's, it's, it's most symbolic of peace uh, as you can possibly get, especially the peaceful use of space. That's what we do, we're a civilian space agency. We're very proud uh, NASA nerds and very excited to be doing what, we, what we've always wanted to do for a living our whole lives. So, pass on. Good morning, I'm Tamika Bryant. I am a Deputy U.S. Marshal right here in D.C. District Court. Um, I started my career with the Department of Justice in 2007 as a legal assistant with the U.S. Attorney's Office. And after I was there a few years, I decided to go to the Marshal Service. Um, I love criminal justice. So I became a criminal program specialist in 2011 and everybody was like, Tamiko, you should become a deputy marshal. And I'm like, me? I can do that? And I thought about it. I was like, you know what? Maybe I will. Um, so with the U.S. Marshal Service, um, occasionally they'll open up job positions for us to become deputy marshals um, just to administrative employees. And so I finally applied, and um, I went to basic deputy marshal training, and here I am now. Awesome. So I want to just put it out there that we have FBI. I put the FBI right there and U.S. Marshal right there. So I want y'all to know that we're very well protected here as we sit in this, on this stage. Um, and with that being said, Tamiko, because when we had lunch, it was just amazing how you explained your, your path as being the only female 
and not even thinking that you would be where you are today. So can you please share with us, how did you overcome some of those obstacles uh, that you faced while you were moving up the, the, the ladder? So um, one part, the biggest part of becoming a deputy marshal is going through the training, deputy marshal training. And the first day of class, um, I arrived and I'm sitting there, I'm looking around, nothing but men showing up. It's like, oh my goodness, am I the only woman? Yes, I am the only female. I was so nervous, but um, I continued to um, persevere. And I had a lot of my brothers there to support me. But the main thing that kept me going was my uh, motivation, which were my nieces um, and um, some of my cousins that look up to me. I wanted to set a good example for them, and I wanted to make a difference in my community. Awesome. So what was your story like, Michelle? Um, what, 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 what obstacles did you face to where you are now at a successful stage? Right. Well, being a uh, nuclear engineer going to engineering school, uh, at the time I was going to school, um, there was one female for every 10 male students. And so, you know, kind of like uh, Tomiko, uh, there were quite a few engineering classes that I took. I was the only female. I'm like, okay, I can handle this. I got in. I was you know, on the curator's scholarship. I had an Air Force ROTC scholarship. I'm like, I can do this. Um, my mother, she, she was my mentor. <laughs> she wanted to be an engineer and couldn't because her father wouldn't allow her to do that. She became a teacher. And so she was behind me. You know, whatever you want to do, you can go do it. Um, so I've always had a really good support system and people cheering me on, telling me, you know, you're capable, you can do it. It's about perseverance, you know, continuing to do and know that you have the ability to do something, uh, even if you get knocked down. Um, some people know this, not a lot of people do, but when I was in uh, university, I flunked out of school. I flunked out of Rolla, took a semester back at home, helped out with some family issues going on there, um, and reapplied, got back in, had switched my major from aerospace to <laughs> nuclear engineering, and ended up on the dean's list by the time I graduated. So it's all about you know, knowing you can do it, and if you get knocked down, pick yourself up, reassess, and start again. Absolutely, absolutely. So, McCole, with the FBI, you know, because you shared some things with us during lunch of, you know, you never thought um, that, you know, where you are now. So kind of, I don't want to, you know, share your story. I'll, I'll, I'll have you do that. I have to tell you, we met for lunch maybe two weeks ago, and I've been so busy, I don't remember that story. <laughs> but <laughs> I will piggyback off what Tamiko said. Um, when I arrived at the FBI Academy, um, my class was very large. We had 58 students in my class and only eight women. So we naturally bonded together because we knew we were joining a male-dominated environment. And so we formed this bond for 17 weeks. And that perseverance got me through saying, okay, I don't have to be better than the next man in the class. I just want to be better for me. So that was important for me. Okay. And Tyra? I honestly, I, I think I was just so driven on what I wanted to do. It never occurred to me when I was the only woman or if any obstacles were set in front of me, I just kept going. Um, and when I look back, I didn't, it didn't even dawn on me for the first two years that I, I worked at NASA that I was like one of only two women in the whole engineering department. What got me most was that I was so young and they were all so much senior. That was what was in my mind. Um, until someone asked me, what was it like being the only woman in engineering or one of only two? And I'm like, what? Oh, you're right. I looked around. So for me, I'm one. I'm one of those women that you heard from the undersecretary. I just kept going because it's something I wanted to do. If I look back, I can probably tell you um, all the way back to middle school some of the some of the obstacles that were uh, were obviously in my place, but I didn't really realize it. Um, but um, I also believe that you know my path has been my journey, and um, and I'm here today because you just if you want something, you know what you want, and you want it bad enough. Uh, you just keep going until it happens. So now we're going to dive a little deeper because we have some interesting careers up here. 
And so I need you to dive a little deeper because I'm going to go back to Mako <laughs> on the mass destruction and all that stuff that she shares. So has there been a time in your career um, when your assertiveness was misconstrued because of your profession? One instance I can't really um, relate to at this point, but I'm sure in my profession work in weapons and mass destruction, I'm on a countermeasures operations side of the house, um, which again is male dominated environment. Um, the decisions that I have to make going forward um, when we go to different countries, like uh, last February I was in Morocco, and making decisions to go to that country and figure out what they're doing on their drone program and how we can bring that back to the United States and implement it. I'm sure I rubbed a few feathers wrong that day, but when I came back with my ideas and I supported my ideas and implemented my ideas, it went over well. So maybe it initially it didn't, but going forward, my, I'm sure my, um, um, my input and my, my foresight made a whole difference in the world, so they look past my assertiveness. So Deputy. <laughs> Share a little bit of how have your assertiveness ever been misconstrued with what you have to do and, and how does that work in your daily environment? Okay. Well, um, for me and probably with many other women, we wear so many hats. We're, we're moms, we're sisters, we're aunts. We just wear so many hats. So at work a lot of times, um, if there's a problem, I just want to go ahead and solve it. I, I just want to go ahead and take it and, and make sure that it's handled. And a lot of times it's like, hey, stay in your lane. And it's kind of hard to do that because in your regular life, you multitask so much. So when you're at work, you want to multitask. So sometimes um, being assertive in that way is kind of you know, off-putting to some people. But to other people, they're like, yes, we need more people like you. So always be assertive. <laughs> always. She said always be assertive. How do you see that, Tyra? <laughs> so this is funny, because this is one question we all talked about, like as we were sitting up here saying, what are you going to say? Huh? What are you going to say? Uh, this is a tough one. But I, I think we all came to the same agreement that um, we don't go in recognizing we're going to be assertive today, or in this meeting, I'm going to be assertive. We, we, like, like you heard Tamika, we just, we show up and we do what comes naturally. And I've been fortunate in my culture, at least at NASA, that, you know, I know the folks, I know the culture. You kind of know when you're being um, overly assertive versus uh, authoritative uh, versus influential. And those are all different things. Um, and so I have never been accused of being overly assertive to my face. Probably more so with my daughter's school, because uh, that's probably where I'm more assertive these days. <laughs> that's okay. all. Okay. And Michelle? Well, I'm going to turn the question a little bit. Okay. Um, when I first started working with the Russians uh, about 20 years ago, uh, imagine me, 20 years younger, leading as the head of the delegation leading 10 gentlemen who are old enough to be my father, who are all technical experts. And we're all in Russia to look at the plutonium production reactors in Russia, to evaluate their operational status, to see how we want to further monitor them for the next 20 some odd years. And I'm the leader, and we're going through our work, and we're evaluating the reactors and climbing through underneath the reactors and all through stuff. And my interpreter, wonderful gentleman from uh, DITRA, Defense Threat Reduction Agency, comes to me one evening after we've had dinner and said, they've been asking about you. I'm like, what do you mean they've been asking about me? He's like, well, they don't quite understand why you're here. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, so what did you tell him? He's like, well, I told him, unlike the Russian culture, women in the United States get their jobs because they know what they're doing. They're not just there as a figurehead. And so, you know, it was like, okay, fine, you know, I'm used to this from engineering school, you know, not being taken seriously sometimes. I just kind of, you know, brushed it off and kept going. Well, then later in the trip, there was a lady reporter that came to do a piece on our visit. And one of her first questions to me was, so 
this is kind of a technical trip that you're on. Is it too tough for you? I'm like, okay, how do I answer this question? I was like, well, you know, I have a nuclear engineering degree. I studied for this. This is exactly the kind of thing that, you know, I know how to do. So, jump ahead 20 years, I'm still working with the same, a lot of the same Russians. They respect me. They know I've been to all their reactors, except for one, which we're going in June. And uh, so, you know, it's just one of those, you build those relationships, but it started out with, who the heck are you and why are you here? That's interesting. So in closing, um, I just want to ask one um, important question um, about um, what is your opinion? Um, what would you say is the most important attribute one needs to possess to achieve success in your job, in your job, and so on? So let's start with Michelle. Well, that's an easy one. Um, my, my nephew, when he was in elementary school, no, actually he was in preschool, he had to do a report. And they asked him, what was the book about? And he said, perseverance. There you have it. <laughs> and it's like, uh, you want to elaborate? You know, when you want, what, what else? It's about perseverance. And that truly is what it is. Um, you know, willing to continue to move forward and, and do your job to the best of your ability, and even willing to take on those jobs that others aren't necessarily willing to take on. But you do those, those not so fun jobs to the best of your ability as well. And you just keep, you keep moving on and being part of the team. Tara? I have to say collaboration spirit of collaboration. Um, keep an open mind with anyone you're collaborating with. Um, look for the common goals uh, and, and consider all angles and, and hear, really hear what someone else is saying and, and work to influence uh, collaboration. Tamiko? Um, boldness. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's very important to be bold. Um, in our career, um, you really have to be bold. Um, but in any endeavor that you do, I think it's very important to have that boldness so that you can go to the next level. A lot of times fear will hold us back. So how do you know what you're good at if you never try? So always be bold. That's interesting. And Nicole? I like boldness, but I'm gonna go with confidence. And being in law enforcement, you have to be confident. Um, even when you're wrong, you still have to be confident and admit when you're wrong and continue on to get the right answer that you need. So I'm going to stick with confidence. Okay, awesome. Well, that's all that we have for this panel discussion. I want to thank you all. And, and um, we're going to continue on with uh, the presentation of the awards. Okay? Well, thank you everyone for your participation. I'm Ann Augustine. I'm the Principal Deputy Director in the Office of Economic Impact and Diversity. And it's wonderful to see so many of you here today. Um, I want to thank um, Administrator Gordon Haggerty for her wonderful remarks and our esteemed panelists for joining us today. And hopefully I'll remember um, it's confidence, perseverance, boldness, and... A collaboration. And actually, on that point of collaboration, um, this uh, event today was, um, you know, it's a collaborative effort. Um, I want to thank uh, Cecily Johnson from our Office of Economic Impact and Diversity um, for doing such a great job moderating the panel and for actually putting this together in collaboration with our uh, friends and partners from the National Nuclear Security Administration. Um, I want to especially point out Marianne Fresco, who's been a very gracious and working with us every step of the way. I'd be remiss also if I didn't mention our other um, colleagues in the Office of Economic Impact and Diversity, um, not only in our Office of um, Equity and Diversity, uh, but our entire organization that does work collaboratively on a day-to-day -day on all of our work product, but most especially in these special events, which take an enormous amount of time. I should recognize uh, Sharon Wyatt, who was here, 
at 5.30 this morning, and he's here every morning at 5.30, but they were running around doing some last minute um, changes, and, and Sharon is our acting associate deputy uh, director of uh, equity and diversity. So thank you to everybody. We do have some small tokens of our appreciation, and I'll ask my boss, uh, Director Campos, if he would be gracious enough to come up so that we can make the presentation to the panelists and to Administrator Gordon Haggerty. Um, thank you. Okay. I'll go ahead and, and read this one, um, which is um, our a recognition award to Undersecretary for Nuclear Energy and Administrator of the National Nuclear Security Administration, Lisa E. Gordon Haggerty. And it reads as follows, in recognition of your participation in the Department of Energy's 2019 Women's History Month observance, Visionary Women, Champions of Peace and Nonviolence, held on March 20th, 2019. We recognize your trailblazing leadership, which has contributed greatly to the national, to the nuclear security across our nation and across the globe. You are a champion of diversity, inclusivity, and professional merit. Your outstanding service to our country is to be commended. Thank you very much. These look like they're in reverse order. Well, no, I'll move them to the next one is to Tamika Bryant. We have a certificate of appreciation, and um, uh, it says, in recognition of your outstanding support to the 2019 Women's Program, um, Visionary Women Champions of Peace and Nonviolence, which was held today at the U.S. Department of Energy, your insights and contributions to the panel discussion were instrumental in the success of this program. Your standard of excellence serves as a sterling example for all employees at the U.S. Marshal Service and the nation. The department would like to thank you for a job well done and wish you continued success in the future. Thank you so much. And we'll have a picture with you. Thank you. And maybe with the enterprise. Thank you very much. Um, and Nicole Spencer, if you'd be kind enough to come up from the FBI. And um, this one reads along the same lines, again, with your insights and contributions to the, we thank you for the insights and contributions to your panel discussions. It was very much instrumental to the success of the program. And we are saying here that your standard of excellence serves as a sterling example for the employees at the Federal Bureau of Investigation and the nation. And the Department of Energy would like to thank you for a job well done and wish you continued success in the future. Thank you so much. And we'll have you up here. Thank you very much. And Michelle Smith, after, oh, excuse me, so sorry. And this certificate of appreciation reads almost identically until we get to thanking you for your excellence um, and serving as a, a sterling example for all the employees at the U.S. Department of Energy here and the nation. And uh, the Department of Energy wants to thank you for your job well done and to wish you continued success in the future. Thank you so very much. And finally, we have Dr. Tara Rutley. And um, Dr. Rutley, your certificate reads very similar, except rather than read through the whole thing, that your standard of excellence, we're, we're jumping to the bottom here, uh, serves as a sterling example for all of the employees of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration and the nation. And here at the Department of Energy, we really wish you all the best for continued success in the future and for everything you've done. So thank you very much. Well, we, we thank you all very much for your attendance today, and we wish you a good day.